All right, so as you can see here, I have VJ Jones with me, poolside, and we thought it would be an interesting thing to do a bit of a shoe review. And mind you, it's not a shoe review where we're going to start talking about what shoe to purchase brand-wise, but what to look for in a shoe in order to have the appropriate wear based on what you're trying to get done. Fair enough? Yeah, absolutely. Where do you want to start? Um, so I think that we're just going to talk about some different subjects and then why you like or dislike them. So we'll start with an all-time Richard classic. Okay. All right. Going right for the throat. So we're going for what we have here is a very high cushioned shoe with a more narrow toe box. All right? So give us your thoughts on a shoe like this and why you Ooh, like it. Oh boy, like. where do I start? Okay, so this is really entertaining because um, obviously I think that this company long ago had put out a contract on me because I've been such a staunch um, pundit. Is that the new <laughs> political term? Uh, against the use of a shoe that has such a high stack height and such a high cushion rate. And so, th in my opinion, I think they're blowing it all the way around. So, one of the things that I don't like about this shoe, hold and... On, on. Look, look at the camera. More. Okay, one of the things that I don't like about this shoe, one of the things I don't like about this shoe is that it comes to a point, and that's the traditional design of most shoes. And I really have a hard time with this. I don't know who thought this through because... I don't know about you, but my big toe is not stationed in the middle of my toes. It's out to the outside. And I need my toe box to be a little broader because your toes need to splay out. They need to be able to move. And when you entrain your toes to be trapped in this position, you're going to end up with black toenails. You're going to end up with potentially all sorts of problems the longer you go, the longer you run. And speaking going long, a lot of ultra marathoners like to run in a shoe with a great big cushion. The theory is cushion makes it easier on you when, when you hit the ground. Well, there is nothing that could be further from the truth. Fact of the matter is, when you land on something that's soft, your body will become rigid. When you land on something that's rigid, your body will become supple. And so your body adapts based on the type of terrain it's going to make contact with, assuming that it's provided with the information it needs to make a decision like that. So when this material dampens the signals from your feet to your central nervous system, you're at a disadvantage. So you're basically reacting to the ground contact as opposed to being proactive about the ground contact. So short story is avoid heavily cushioned shoes. They do not save you. It's definitely um, one of the misconceptions in the shoe industry and is perpetrated by manufacturers that are trying to sell the crap out of shoes to people that don't know what they're doing. Uh, all right. Um, then we'll guess we'll touch on the uh, <laughs> opposite spectrum there. Um, yeah, so another trail shoe, but I would say opposite in almost every way. Uh, super wide toe box, zero drop, not a ton of cushion here. So what is your professional opinion on that? Well, so I like this shoe. I like this shoe for a lot of reasons. One, obviously enough, you could see that there's a broader toe box which I feel is very important. Your toes need room to move, folks. And so there are a lot of shoes in the industry that are starting to, to uh, follow this path, and I think it's a wise decision. I could tell you that me personally, once upon a time when I went into a broader toe box shoe, I just never turned back. I cannot put myself in a shoe that has that pointiness. It doesn't work for me. Um, and incidentally, I've also found that zero drop format, which is meaning the heel is no higher than the forefoot, works for me as well because when you're on an elevated heel, got one of those? Elevated heel? Uh, dude, I'm, industry's made of them, dude. We're at, okay. Yeah, let's, look at, let's look at this. Okay, so there you go. So now this is not that crazy, but it looks like it might be, um, where the heel is much or is higher, and I'd say much, than the forefoot. And this is actually not a really good um, subject to look at because we just don't carry that thing around here, you know. I, I, uh, I th most of these are my shoes, and um, I got rid of all of my super high. Well, let's look at this. Look at this dude. 
So you see how that heel is not only elevated, it has jet propulsion <laughs> going on underneath it. And then relative to the, the forefoot, you can see there's an elevation here. So what this is going to do is it's going to toss off your balance point. So you're going to find that because if you're upright and neutral, you're cool. But if you're on that ledge, you're not. And you have to adjust your posture, and it'll put a hot spot in your low back. And then it also puts your balance point ahead of your body, which means it's going to it's going to encourage you to land on your heel ahead of your body. And so this is actually teaching you to do the wrong thing. And we'll get to this in a little bit. But going back to this shoe, uh, zero drop, minimal cushioning. So uh, your polar moment of inertia, that's a race car uh, term, you're lower to the ground. And so you're not way up in the air and precariously balancing on this cushion like we saw before. Um, uh, for OCR, this is a great shoe. As VJ pointed out to me earlier, I didn't know. There's actually some vents here. So if you have water in the shoe, it allows for the water to come out. Or water to go into the shoe. <clears throat> How many thumbs would give this? Are we doing a four thumb? It's based on a four, four thumb being better. I'd give it like a, a three and a half thumb. We're going with three, three... How many thumbs? Th three and, and, a, a half. and a half thumbs. And a half thumbs. Treat it nicely, though. Okay. All right. What else? Um, well, I guess this is kind of similar, just a little more cushioned than that one because it's not a racing shoe, but the foam is nice and firm, which you are a big fan of, right? Yeah. So a yeah. little higher stack height isn't always the worst thing as long as you have something that's firm so you're not just squishing like a marshmallow, right? Absolutely. And clearly you could see that these shoes have been used. We don't go to the store and show you the brand new shoe. We're not trying to sell shoes here. We're trying to sh sell concept. And as he suggested, the EVA foam in this shoe is pretty, pretty stiff, pretty firm. And what you want is protection, folks. You want protection from ground. And that's what this is providing me. And this show, the, actually, this is my shoe. And you can see that the toe box is nice and broad, which allows me to let my toes splay out. I'm not being elevated. This is zero drop. This, I think, is a winner. Um, actually, this is one of the older versions. Actually, I think this is better than the newer versions they're coming out with. They're starting to get a little too soft in the bottom. Um, I think I might even go back to wearing this shoe now that, I mean, what's, what's really interesting, if you look at the wear pattern on this shoe, it's non-existent. I mean, you can see there's a little wear in the forefoot, which is telling you that I, I would run on my forefoot. Uh, but I can get a lot more mileage out of this shoe. A lot of people ask, how many miles should you get from a pair of shoes? Well, you're going to find that if you run better, you have less issue. When you have corruption in the way you land when you run, let's just say that you have some soft EVA foam and you land the outside edge of your heel. I know a lot of people, are going to, this is going to resonate with them. Uh, you start to wear down the outside edge of this EVA foam. So now you're tracking in that, that, that gully that you created for yourself. And now you really got a lot of rotation and you're actually training yourself to run badly. Um, but when you run well, your wear patterns are better. You get a lot more volume out of your running. A couple, three years old, I could continue to wear this shoe without an issue. Yeah. And uh, just so people know, the industry standard is usually about 400 miles for a shoe. Yeah. And that shoe's probably got content. well over that easily. Richard travels long distances. Once upon a time. <laughs> Honestly, I have not done a lot of running lately. I'm getting older. It's getting tough. I'm not going to lie. So I'm going to do a shoe here that um, I like a lot, but um, has good things and bad things about it. So I'd like to see what your thoughts are on this. It's a four millimeter drop, pretty firm foam underfoot, low profile. Check it. Well, so um, he indicated that it's a four mil drop, which is pretty close to neutral, pretty close to zero. I'm okay with that. Some people have a bit of an issue with uh, getting all the way to the ground. I would recommend that if you're, you're feeling like that you're a little tight in the calves and uh, you have Achilles issues when you're trying to go to zero, maybe the four might be a better idea for you. Uh, as opposed to the other shoe we looked at, which was completely zero drop, this gives you a little bit of a ledge. Uh, I love that the EVA foam is stiff. I love that it's got good grip. And uh, the only thing that I would have to say that I'm not real good with would be the fact that it tends to want to put your big toe in the middle of your foot again. Um, and VJ suggested to me that since he started wearing this, he noticed that the toe box was actually pretty broad, even though it has that contour to the center. 
Um, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. I just, I just can't, can't get past this look. I just know my foot doesn't want to do this. So, so that's my only, so I'd give this, I'd still give this a good solid three-ish, three and a half maybe. I'd, I'd say three. Three is We're good. We're going with three. By the way, three's not bad. It's not a two, it's a three. Sounds good. All right, let's move to two separate that are two separate shoes, two different brands that are kind of um, both tending to be racing shoes or up tempo running shoes. Okay. But um, two very different styles. Oh boy. All right, so um, both are lower drop. I'd say one is about four, one's going to be zero. One's got a real wide toe box, the other a little more narrow. Um, let's start with. The one that I think you're going to like the most. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, you know, here we go. Big toe in the middle. No, it's not going to happen for me. Uh, I don't like that their interest is to try to create some cushion. Whenever you go down this rabbit hole, you're, you're barking up the wrong tree. That's not the same thing, is it? A rabbit hole? You're either hole going in the rabbit hole or you're barking up the tree. Which one is it? <laughs> it's Unless a rabbit hole goes up the tree. Either hunting a squirrel or rabbit, one or the other. But anyway, the, the, what do you call these things? Uh, clouds? Uh, cloud pods. Yeah. Cloud pod. Cloud pod. So they got these little air sacs here that's supposed to dissipate your impact as you land. And this actually will mess with your serv central nervous system, give you some false read on what you're trying to do. Um, I don't love it. And I don't love that they're actually trying to create a heel here. Um, this is probably where they're getting that four mil from because the shoe looks almost zero drop. Um, but it's light, it's pliable, it's relatively firm, other than the sacks. And there we go again with the toe thing, opposed to... Now, quick question. Um, what is your opinion on shoes that do a full ground contact foam versus having these two separate spaces underneath the foot? You know how a lot of, say, Asics or other brands will have this kind of bridge in between the heel portion of the shoe and then the forefoot. Well, I, I guess the thought would be, to, my thought would be, is that when you land on the ground and as your arch starts to settle to, to the ground, which it needs to do, um, this bridge that they're creating here is not necessarily creating support. It's actually looking for an opportunity to collapse, I would almost think. Um, I don't know. I don't, I, I'm, I, I'm going to call uh, uh, NFI. <laughs> NFI, Okay. <laughs> Um, so for those of you, that's a technical term in the industry for no freaking idea. Okay? I don't know. That's good. All right. Then on the other end of the spectrum, tell us what you think of this one. Okay. Now, here we go. Happy to see that there's a nice broad toe box. Very light upper. So minimal weight. We don't want to have anything. We don't need anything up here. We want the shoe to protect our foot. We want the shoe not to influence the way we move. I've said this a million times. I'm going to say it one more time for this camera. Every shoe that you put on your foot will influence your natural functionality. Every shoe you put on your foot will influence your natural functionality. And the less information that the shoe tries to shove down your throat, the better. So I don't want this to be an influence. I don't want an arch support. I don't want um, motion control or um, stability or cushion and all these things that they use as marketing hype to sell shoes. I want the shoe to protect me from the environment I'm in. Um, this is a little cushy for me, but it's, it's not terrible. It's not, I mean, opposed to a lot of them. Um, you know, you got to start minimizing the evils, and I think that this is a pretty damn good shoe for road. It's nice and light. It doesn't get in your way. Lets you do what you got to do. Well, how many thumbs? Uh, I'd go three. Three. Thumbs. Good solid three. It's a tough crowd here today. Main keys to focus on from you. So we're saying that stack height, you want it to be lower. But if it is a little more cushioned, you want to make sure it's a firm EVA. Yeah, that's right? correct. Okay. And then on top of that, um, we want to make sure the toe box is nice and wide, enough space to display your toes. You get a natural function of the foot rather than restricting it because you don't have a, a Tom Cruise toe. Right? A what? You know how, like, back in the day, Tom Cruise used to have, like, a tooth in the middle of it? You got it fixed. <laughs> so, yeah, bad reference. But um, actually, I wanted you to address something. So a lot of people go into running shoe stores, run specialty. Like, they'll come talk to me. 
and then when we see that they have an instability, that their arch likes to overpronate, a lot of times there'll be recommended stability or a shoe with extra corrective support under the arch, a posting, a firmer foam under the arch, something like that. And you said that you don't want to see arch support in a shoe. So say someone has an issue with overpronating, how do they correct that without going for a different kind of footwear? Okay, cool. Okay, so the, the broad answer would be realize that the shoe cannot correct the problem. The shoe will not correct the problem. There's never been a study conducted where they said, well, this particular shoe solves those kind of problems. Never has happened. Now, there are orthotics that people will vie for when they have issues with their, their, their gait. And, um, you know, the quick fix is you put a ledge underneath the arch and then you're supported. And so all of a sudden it starts to feel wonderful again. But try to imagine if I was to put a cast on your leg because you broke your leg and you kept that leg casted for six weeks, eight weeks, whatever. You take the cast off, aside from having a very hairy leg, what you're gonna find is you're going to have atrophy in the musculature. You're gonna to lose tone in the musculature. When you start relying on an appliance to hold up your arch, you're gonna become dependent upon it, and you're gonna get weaker, and that's not gonna solve the problem. So the, the thing that you want to do, and it's the harder road, I get it, is look at the way you're moving, correct the way you move. So for example, if you land on your heel first, most people will land on the heel first and they'll rotate out to what's called the varus edge of their foot towards their pinky toe. And then as they start to come over their foot, they land like this. And they basically bypass the whole mechanism that's responsible for developing stability in your arch, which is referred to as the windlass mechanism. As this great toe flexes like this, you're going to start, this is mobility, you're going to cause for stability in, in the midfoot of the foot, midfoot of the foot, in your <laughs> midfoot. And then so this creates stability here, mobility, stability here. Stability here provides mobility in the ankle. You need to be able to dorsiflex at least 30 degrees to get a good, solid, uh, stable contact with the earth, and it goes from there. So. At the end of the day, you want to change the way you move. If you land on your forefoot properly first and allow your heel to settle to the earth as you, as you start to transfer over the, your, your, so your foot's out here and you land and boom, you come to, to a complete landing, you've engaged your foot and stabilized your foot. Your foot's designed to do the work. You don't need a shoe to stabilize. Matter of fact, most people that have corruption in the way they move, if I take their shoes off of them and have them run on natural surfaces, it corrects itself. How is it that by taking the shoe off, you're able to run without pain? How is it that you can run more effectively and more efficiently off your forefoot absent the shoe? So think in those terms. If you want to get in a better place with your shoe, excuse me, a better place with your running, find a shoe that will not uh, uh, inhibit your natural functionality. That's my feeling. Fair enough. And just as a point of reference, um, I've brought this up to people before because I work and run specialty. And I'm one of the people that will sell you a stability shoe. But there was, <laughs> there was this study that was done. I think you've heard of it. It was by Runner's World. It was in Australia. It was done in Australia. I heard the, I heard the study first from Dr. Ar Ar Arlene Davis. Mm -hmm. And she is the uh, director of um, biomechanics at the Spalding Running Center at Harvard University. She's like big dog, one of the sharpest people on the planet when it comes to running mechanics. She shared that, that study with me that you're going to splay out here. Yeah, so um, they had like um, the double blind study thing where they had two separate groups of runners and they... Um, they brought in people from run specialty, someone like me that's trained to watch people walk, do a gait analysis, and see what kind of shoe would be recommended to them. So one group was fitted by professionals in the industry. The other group, they just let them pick a shoe off the wall. Like, I like green, so I'm going to get that shoe. And they let people pick a shoe off the wall, any color, just based on what they thought looked cool or what they thought their preference was. And the concentration or um, the amount of injuries that happened in each group were the same. 
based on being fit for a shoe or just choosing whatever shoe looked cool, the people that got injured were going to get injured no matter what. So it's it usually comes down to running mechanics and, and the way you move, right? Well, yeah. So the bottom line was the influence that they got from the clerk at the running shoe shop was no better than their own decision to pick a color or type of shoe that, that seemed appealing to them. Because at the end, job. Well, because at the end of the day, it wasn't a function of shoe design. It was just um, whatever was going to happen was going to happen because it came down to the way they move. You don't correct the way you move, you're going to run into these problems. It seems like such a long road and we're lazy as a species in this country. We don't want to, to learn. We don't want to put in the work. Well, look, if you love to run and you want to continue to run, you need to invest in the ability to run more effectively. And if you do, you're going to start noticing you can almost get away with almost anything except for maybe something like this. Should we go here? Do it. All right. So I don't know if you could see this, but I kept these shoes. These shoes I've had in my lab for about 10 years now. And you can see it says, Rich at DHP, you saved my life. Guy comes into my lab. <clears throat> it was a project I got contracted to do a VO2 test. Uh, he's actually a race car driver. But he decided that he was going to try to do a bucket list event. He was going to climb the seven summits. Tallest mountain ranges in the world, all of which in one year, which, by the way, if you know anything about mountain climbing, it's nearly impossible to do. He had never climbed mountains before, which makes it almost insurmountable. Uh, we're including Everest, all right? Uh, but anyway, we're doing a VO2 test it's for an IMAX movie of his quest to climb the seven summits. He shows up in this shoe, gets on the treadmill, is incapable of completing the VO2 test because he had knee pain and back pain. I took him out of this shoe. I berated him for about 15 minutes about why he should not do this. And the fact is that obviously he's not going to climb Everest in the shoe, but he's training to climb Everest in this shoe. And he's causing all kinds of running-related injuries. And so his incapacity to train puts him at a disadvantage when he tries to improve his capacity to do these climbs. I said, if you keep running in this, it will kill you when you try to climb Everest. It'll be the death of you. Uh, and I use this in my lab as a sample of the devil in the running shoe industry. You don't want to buy into these fangled... By the way, I've seen it's really popular these days to really get these big, broad airbags underneath the shoes. I think Nike, uh, this is also a Nike, is, I wasn't going to go into brands, but apparently they, they are the biggest um, perpetrator of the crime. Um, don't get caught up in this. This will end you. And it also wouldn't have been as bad if he would have just, if he was running with better mechanics in a shitty shoe. But on top of that, he was running very poorly. It's almost impossible to run well in a shoe like this. It does encourage a heel strike. It's, it's why they put actual... Well, not only that, but it actually inhibits the capacity for your heel to touch down and to get the reciprocal response from the ground off your heel you want a little bit of that payback and this is trying to do that for you this is like jet propulsion thing uh, i don't know what the hell they were thinking when they did this they thought you know maybe they're going to sell it to the george jetson set i don't know maybe uh, but um just to add some value to what having good mechanics can do for you um i read this story about this guy he wanted um he studied running mechanics and he was a really really good runner. Um, he ended up doing this thing to prove that shoes don't actually affect you. Um, he ended up running like 300 miles with his shoes on opposite feet. <laughs> and yeah, that was he, brave. He, uh, yeah, he ended up running three or 400 miles in the shoes and he didn't get a single injury the entire time because mechanics really well. Now, I'm not saying that that's possible for anybody or anything, but... Um, don't try that at home. Yeah, don't. Um, <laughs> Well, I mean, I mean, we could go on and on about this. I have friends that run marathons barefoot. I'm not, I'm not um, an advocate of barefoot running on unnatural surfaces, running on pavement, concrete, things like this. Not a great idea. But I would suggest that running on a treadmill or natural surfaces on occasion to re-engage, just kind of teach your body to find that natural function, uh, you're going to start to find that it, it, a couple things will happen. First, you're going to develop strength in your feet, which is really, really important. Uh, by the way, I am right now barefoot, and I spend most of my day barefoot. Oh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, pe people that come to visit me for gate work, they see me 
with shoes on and, and they're like disappointed. Said, Why are you wearing shoes, dude? They were so <laughs> expecting me to be barefoot when they come see me. Um, but I've just learned over years, and I'm getting old, uh, I've learned over the years that by developing strength in my feet, natural functionality in my feet, right on up from the ground up, I'm just functionally in a better place. You know, that's, that's really all I could say about that. I believe you. So is there anything else we want to share? Um, let's see. I mean, I got some, like, weird stuff. Oh, dude. We forgot. So, th yeah, thank you. I completely forgot about this. This is fun. So check this out. As you can see, there's like a rocker here. This is like a, a carbon shank with this rocker, like a diving board. And um, I was approached by a company some years ago <clears throat> with this shoe, and they said, look, we'd like you to help us developing a marketing position to sell this shoe. And so we thought about it, thought about it, and messed around. I had people put it on and get on the treadmill with it, and I'd ask them questions. What's it doing for you? And what they wanted to suggest that because you're on this diving board, it encourages you to get on your, your forefoot. And it actually encourages you to um, incur, encourage more gait. So in other words, your, your cadence is going to improve. And I had to present to this outdoor retailer's um, presentation we had. And uh, they didn't have a shoe for me. I'm a size 13. They had to fly somebody to China to get a pair of shoes for me so that I could wear the shoe while I present it. I wore the shoe for about eight hours over the course of the day doing the presentations and, you know, mingling and whatever, and my back was trashed when I got home. Trashed. I gave the shoes to somebody I didn't like. <clears throat> but at the end of the day, this kind of shows you what the, what the industry, the lengths the industry goes through to try to um, get you entertained by their products so that you'll purchase it. This is so wrong. Everything about this is wrong. And and beyond, I mean... I'm going to interrupt you. Yeah. We're almost out of time here. Um, <coughs> running out of space. So just to recap, wide toe box is good. Firmer shoe is good. Um, lower drop is also good. But most importantly is dialing in your mechanics. Right? Coming from the North American... OCR 3K champion. That's right? it.